we did this as an experimental project starting last year, and uh, it uh, was much more wildly successful than any of us imagined it would be. So we're doing it again this year. But long story short, the America's Public Forum Project is a partnership between Braver Angels, the National Institute for Civil Discourse, and occasionally other good friends and partners of our, ours uh, in the civic life space uh, to showcase a, uh, a, um, a higher standard of, uh, of intellectual and civic discourse uh, among people who study a lot of really interesting in-depth uh, things from the scholarly community, the journalistic community, the activist community, the business community, various other places. Um, we bring them we have we uh, and we interview them about uh, some of the things that they have been working on and have just a national public forum about it. I uh, expect a lot more of these over the course of this year, especially starting in April. Uh, but uh, for now, this is going to be the first of those on the subject of curiosity. And I am actually quite curious to see what it's going to look like. So without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a wonderful American, a wonderful human being, a dear friend of mine, and one of my favorite colleagues in Braver Angels, uh, April Lawson, the director of debates and the, uh, the uh, uh, moderator and host for this evening. April, it's all yours. All right, thank you so much, Luke. Um, so that was your tech instruction, and I have to give you uh, one little cultural instruction to go with it. And if I see Bruce McKenzie, and if any of you are uh, have ever seen me run a debate, you, you're you familiar with jazz hands. Um, but if you're not, uh, this is what jazz hands look like. They also accept spirit fingers. Yes, excellent. And they're a way of showing approval. And so since we're all in separate places, um, it's just nice to be able to have some kind of communication that's visual. Uh, it, this is evidently also the, the sign language for applause, which I learned um, pretty recently. But so if you like something that's being said, or um, you know, you just want to show approval, uh, you can give jazz hands. And um, so first, I'd like to, for us all to give jazz hands to Luke and Dennis, because they've done a lot of hard work in putting this together. Yes, yes, yes. Um, very good. And uh, so tonight is actually, in my view, a good news uh, uh, panel. It's a, it's, this should be a, a little bit of a, a lift um, for a dark time of year. But I actually want to start on a slightly um, uh, down note because uh, unfortunately today, um, a member of the Braver Angels community passed away. Um, the, uh, we, we have a, a close and dear colleague named Reverend Ruff, who many of you probably saw give the remarks, uh, some very stirring remarks at the event we held right after the January 6th events. And uh, he and his wife both um, had COVID and uh, she passed away today and they have young kids. So this is a, a pretty, pretty hard thing. And it was very sudden. So I just want us to take a moment of silence to honor that. and. Um, if you're the kind of person who prays and prayers their way or good vibes or whatever floats your boat, um, we're just gonna take a moment of silence for that. May all of you be healthy and um, it's a reminder to be grateful for all the things we've got. So um, Luke, when you hit mute all, it also mutes me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, the um, tonight, we are going to talk about curiosity. And to me, one of the reasons this is a, a really good topic to talk about right now is that we spend a lot of time and have uh, talking about the negatives about political polarization, right? The, um, the destruction it causes, the um, relationships it ruins, the way that it just uh, is really a plague on the land. Um, and I guess that's not a good <laughs> turn of phrase right now. But anyway, um, we've had a month uh, or two of seeing of just, you know, in the, in the six weeks of this year alone, we've seen a lot of damage done by political polarization. And um, a lot of it, us have experienced that in our personal lives. Um, and so that's really present. But what isn't always as present is um, what would the opposite be? 
right? Like, what would, what are we for? What would the, the, the spirit be if you wanted to walk around as a person in the world who is um, sort of, you know, just your spirit is welcoming, depolarizing. It's something that, that uh, invites people in. And I think curiosity has a lot to do with that. And so uh, we're gonna dive into that tonight from a number of different angles. Um, start with sort of what is curiosity and then talk some about how it fits into society and, and what it can mean. And then we'll spend a good bit of time at the end on um, what does it mean to live a curious life? Like how can we actually use this in our, in our regular daily lives? Um, and then, uh, so we'll talk, we'll chat for about 45 minutes and then we will open the floor to questions. And um, I look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. So tonight, we have the great privilege of being joined uh, by two uh, of my favorite up, uh, rising stars in the, the thinking and writing universe, a red and a blue. Um, so we have Monica Guzman. Uh, Monica, if you would wave, yes, there she is. Monica is a journalist who, <laughs> yes, jazz hands, Mar <laughs> maracas, I like the dance, it's great, yes. Just wake us up there, thank you. Um, so Monica Guzman is a journalist who lives for good conversations sparked by challenging questions. She's the host of Crosscuts Northwest Newsmakers, advisor to Braver Angels, and co-founder of the award-winning Seattle newsletter, The Evergrey. She studied social and political division as a 2019 Henry M. Jackson Fellow and participatory media as a 2016 Harvard Nieman Foundation Fellow and is writing a book about how we can use curiosity to build bridges across divides that is due out in 2022. And we will uh, make sure that you have the link to that before the end. And then we're also joined by, uh, a, these are both dear friends of mine, by, but by my dear friend, Alexandra Hudson. Also, I will refer to you as Lexi, I hope that's okay. Um, Alexandra or Lexi is, yes, there we go, is the curator of Civic Renaissance, a newsletter and intellectual community dedicated to cultural renewal and civil discourse. A former no journalism She's writing a book on civility and by Martin's Press. And we would love it if you would subscribe to her newsletter and to Monica's. And so links for that will go in the chat um, at various times throughout the evening. You will not be sorry. I am subscribed to both and love them. So let's dive in. Um, Lexi, I think we're going to start with you. And uh, because you the inspiration, uh, Lexi was behind this event coming together tonight. Um, and you suggested the topic of curiosity, and I'd like you to just share a little bit about like, um, why? Why is that on your mind? And what does it have to do with political polarization? Thanks, April, and, and thanks, Luke, and thanks to each of you for being here tonight. Um, really thrilled for the chance to talk about this uh, for, for a few minutes. And curiosity is on my mind because I'm a curious person. I love learning. I'm voraciously, um, omnivorously, intellectually curious. I'm constantly learning. And um, uh, I, it's the kind of the topic of uh, my book is on civil discourse and my newsletter community is on kind of lifelong learning and nourishing our minds with truth, goodness, and beauty. And I, I thought of the idea for this um, uh, event for two reasons. One, as we've been talking about, uh, and we're all here because we are concerned of the uh, uh, about the division in our uh, in our country right now. And we want, we, we're, we are eager to, to be a part of the solution. That's why we're all part of very, very Angels, part of that community. Um, and I think curiosity, uh, I'm going to put my cards to the table. I think curiosity can help. <laughs> and um, Monica, um, who I, I'm, I'm so excited for her book coming out, um, she, I, I feel really privileged, but she kind of took me um, into her confidence and shared some of the preview of, of her book, um, some content of, uh, of chapters. And I, I loved our conversation. I think it went on um, for almost two hours. And as she was sharing with me about her book, how she wanted to kind of spark interest and, and conversation. And I said, let's keep this going, but like loop and braver angels and, you know, make it public and see what other people have to say. Um, and so I think that we're all just as eager to hear from, from all of you about on this topic as well. Um, but I thought both the sort of cultural moment we're in in our country, uh, kind of a sad and divided moment, but also a great chance to, um, I think Monica just got her her manuscript in just a few weeks ago so it's incredibly yeah 
jazz jazz fingers all around. It's a very exciting achievement. So uh, a chance for her for to just talk through, continue the conversation that she and I were having. That was just so much fun. A few uh, few few weeks ago. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, well, I think we're all pretty excited to be here tonight. And um, yeah, I'm I'm particularly pleased because you've both just written books that have that that touch on curiosity, and therefore you like have done into the research to understand like what it really is and how it plays in. And so, uh, Monica, I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what you've discovered. So, just to answer the question, what is curiosity? Yeah, so curiosity, first of all, I am so encouraged by everyone being here for this. This is a crazy time. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, a lot of it, maybe not that hopeful, not that optimistic. Curiosity is a way through 100%. And I hope you leave tonight's conversation really convinced of that and convinced that you yourself can take steps in your own life daily to make it effective in your life. So curiosity is a search for knowledge and we've studied it in a bunch of different ways. It's, it's one of the urges, one of the cravings and one of the drives of life, but it's hinged on attention. So compare it for a moment to hunger and thirst. When you're hungry, you're hungry. And until you get food, you will be hungry and it will not be pleasant. When you're curious, you're curious. You know me? <laughs> <laughs> you're curious only so far as your attention is on the gap in your knowledge that you want to fill. The gap between what you know and what you wanna know. Once your attention is away from that gap, curiosity ends. If your brain is convinced that the search for the knowledge to fill that gap will be too much of a slog, curiosity ends. There's all these ways off, there's off ramps to curiosity. My book and my research is about how do you not only get on, but stay on? And how do you not only, you know, start the curiosity engine, but give it fuel so that it's just turbocharged forward. And there are ways to do that, which is super encouraging that the science of curiosity, which is not that old, I started looking into it. I figured, oh, we've been talking about this a long time. Turns out it's been philosophy for a long time and social science, you know, only maybe since uh, the early 1900s. Hmm. And I can go on, April, but I'll let you, uh, I'll let you direct. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was going to ask like, yeah, so so tell us more about the science. So like, it's about a gap, you said. It's not like hunger and thirst. Um, what else has been learned? Yes, yeah, so there are two essential ingredients to curiosity. Uh, one is that gap. You have to actually think, there's something I don't know. That means you have to be aware of it. And this is why the arch villain of curiosity is certainty. Hmm. If you think you already know, there won't be a gap. So we can talk more about that later because there's a whole lot of certainty you can manufacture <laughs> at uh -huh. least, uh, that may not be all that strong um, objectively or through other perspectives. The second really important ingredient to curiosity is baseline knowledge. If you don't know anything about something, you don't know what to ask about. So the way that you can spark your curiosity is to make sure that you are exposing yourself to all kinds of different things you can learn. Imagine being at a cocktail party and you're just kind of, flip, you know, we miss cocktail parties, but you can float <laughs> between groups of people and you're hearing the conversation. Someone's talking about opera. Someone's talking about the movie that just came out. Someone's talking about their work as a scuba diver. I don't know. But the more that you know, you know a little bit about scuba diving. You saw that movie, you know, you, you've been to an opera. Well, your curiosity will go, I wonder what this person knows. Or maybe you'll catch a piece of the conversation will make you wonder, oh, they've seen that opera, I haven't. I now have an information gap, let me go join that conversation. So knowledge begets knowledge. The wider your net, the more that gets caught in it. Uh, and that's a quote from Ian Leslie, who wrote a lovely book about curiosity that I would recommend. So those two things are the, are the elementary things that you absolutely need. And then on top of that, there's two further ingredients. One is a real comfort with complexity. Um, we want to seek what's called cognitive closure, especially when we feel anxious about an information gap. We just want an answer. Like right now, somebody just give us something. So we can <laughs> right? but, um, but oftentimes things are just not that simple. We know that, right? Like real life, not simple. So you have to embrace complexity. Um, and often uh, 
if you think about complexity, the negative way we think about complexity is confusion. Confusion is a really awful state of mind and state of being that we want to get out of. But if you reframe confusion as complexity, it's just, you just need to go ask your questions, right? Confusion is complexity, but before, confu before curiosity has gone and done its work. And then the last thing is you need to be able to reject easy answers. That's the fourth ingredient. Mm. That is in some ways the toughest because right now this information landscape surrounds us with information that's gonna keep us hooked and addicted on our phones, in our silos, no matter what you believe, what your ideology, there's gonna be communities that are just gonna to wanna to suck you in, give you a lot of easy answers about all kinds of things, including what those other people think. And if you accept those easy answers, you're on the off ramp to curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wanna, so you just brought up something that relates to my work and Lexi, I wanna come to you in a second, but just because you just said that, Moni, about um, uh, people staying in their silos and easy answers. So I, um, I wanna talk a little bit about fear because I, uh, I run, so I run the Brave Angels um, debates and, and public discourse team. And what that means is that we spend a lot of time putting people in positions where they're gonna engage directly with people who they know disagree with them about issues they really care about. And I think a lot of people um, show up pretty nervous to that. Uh, and and I th yeah, I just think that that shows up in relationships too. Um, and I, uh, normally my reaction to that is it's okay. You know, we're going to get through this. Like conflict actually is an essential part of relationships. We know that in our personal lives, right? Like that is true in public life too. And uh, the question is, can we do it well? And of course, that's what we try to do here at Braver Angels. Um, but somebody uh, a couple days ago, actually a family member of mine uh, asked me a question that I don't quite know how to answer. And I want to, I want to pose it to you two just to, to see if you can sort of help me out. Um, and that is uh, around conviction. Um, my family member was saying, look, I just, I know you're doing this panel on curiosity. I'm sure it'll be great, honey, but I just don't know. I'm really struggling with that. My, my family member said, because I just can't, um, I think that, uh, that the entire party that this person opposes uh, is enabling things that I consider really dangerous. And I'm just not sure I can tolerate that anymore. And I understand that curiosity is great and they're probably fine people in the sense that like they're probably nice to their, their dogs and cats, but it's, I'm really struggling. And I think there is this question around whether curiosity involves a betrayal of conviction and a uh, betrayal of the things that you really believe. And um, I think the answer is no, but I, I have to admit, I didn't have a persuasive thing to say in that moment. Um, and so I'm, I would just be curious what, haha, curious, what either of you would say about that, how curiosity relates to deeply held beliefs um, about right and wrong. Lexi, maybe we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. If you Thanks, want to weigh in here. I think it's um, an understandable question. I think it's a question that is a is an important barrier to curiosity, and I know we'll talk about uh, barriers to curiosity uh, later on in this call. But just just feeling like you know entertaining the fact, the reality that someone we disagree with or a party we disagree with might have something right, you know, as opposed to my party's all right and your party's all wrong. Like that's a very vulnerable and and unstable place to be on. Because once you say, okay, well maybe they're right on that, what else might they be right about? Like, and, and what else might my own party not be, <laughs> not be completely, you know, correct on? And I mean, curiosity is, is part and parcel with intellectual humility and epistemological humility, recognizing that the, our, the body of, of human knowledge is constantly growing. That's what civilization is. It's the fact that we are, are taking accumulated knowledge and constantly building on it. And like, that's what the scientific method's doing. It's trial and error and, and constantly growing and improving and expanding our knowledge. But but, you know, even science doesn't have it all figured out. Think of like, you know, crazy claims from 100 years ago, um, like, I don't know, or just even a, someone, who was it, someone at Microsoft saying like, the internet is uh, not going to go anywhere or something like that. Like, like we, we, we say things with certainty and we constantly have throughout, throughout history, um, but things change and, um, and humanity is, is limitlessly 
innovative and creative. Like the stuff of science fiction a hundred years ago, being like space travel, that's like commonplace today. Now, you know, going to Mars is science fiction, but Elon Musk is doing that. Like, like I, I just think it's uh, so important to, to remember that um, we, there are, there are a lot of smart people today and there have been a lot of smart people throughout history that have gotten a lot of important stuff wrong both about the world around us about um about morality even like just think about the fact that slavery was an accepted um uh social phenomenon across every culture <laughs> across history like it's only the last two three hundred years and of course i don't there were people in in different eras that argued against slavery of course uh it's not to say everyone thought that way but it was broad it was a broadly accepted cultural phenomenon that today we say no like to subjugate a portion of humanity. Like we, we declare the equality, the fundamental dignity and worth of all persons. And it's not okay to, to subjugate a, a portion of humanity. Um, and and it's, it's a wonderful thing that we can be grateful for that we have that kind of moral consensus today. Uh, but just recognizing the fact that there are a lot of smart people <laughs> throughout history that, that didn't, didn't agree or didn't see it that way. Um, so just just recognizing um, that we don't have all the answers, uh, mm -hmm. that in a, it's an unstable, vulnerable place to be in, um, challenging place to be in. But I know I, I took I was taking notes uh, for, from Mani's uh, kind of overview of the literature on on uh, on curiosity, and I, I I love that kind of comfort with complexity, compl uh, comfort with nuance. And I feel like our whole culture, our whole media diet, like wants to hammer away nuance and just like make everything black and white and that's not reality that's not humanity like we are complex and it's not fair to reduce any one person um to to just their belief on one you know one thing so just staying staying open staying humble staying staying curious is uh um it is not a, a betrayal of conviction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. wonderful so that was fabulous and uh monica i now um because i trust your heart for people more than almost anybody else's i know i want to ask you a hard question which is okay so um i can in broad strokes accept that it's good to have uh to assume that you don't know everything and to um have that kind of humility but tell me how how i can be so if i were you know if we had a time machine and i was transported back a few hundred years um it seems like the hard part is not to be curious about the abolitionists the hard part is to approach the slaveholders with curiosity so tell me like how do you think about that mm. i think a lot of this is what we believe listening means and today the sensibility of a lot of the places where we have our discussions the internet <laughs> is that if you listen to ideas, you endorse those ideas. Mm -hmm. If you listen to an ideology, you are validating that ideology. Uh, people talk about it as platforming. And it, that sensibility is not, does not seem to be limited to the folks that have true powerful platforms, but it's kind of everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the way that I, that I have reframed that is you're, when you listen to someone, you validate them as people. You don't validate their ideas. Now, mm -hmm. I, I've been a journalist for 15 years. I interviewed someone on death row in Texas and two weeks later watched him die. I interviewed him to try to understand why he killed two cab drivers for about $400 in petty cash and understand so that I could tell the story. I am accustomed to listening to people to try to understand them and to tell their story. Not to pass judgment, that's a separate process, but to understand and to listen. That's a very personal choice that people have to make. But to me, if the question is, curiosity is somehow antagonistic to conviction, I would flip that entirely. If you have convictions about your ideas, you welcome challenging perspectives. You feel strongly about them. You want them to be even stronger. You're not going to make them stronger by surrounding yourself with folks who already agree with you or opinions that only make them shine. So Michelle de Montaigne wrote hundreds of years ago, right? 
uh, uh, Lexi, you would know, um, cause you're so awesome at all that awesome, like classic research is great. <laughs> but um, he has this lovely quote about, um, we rub and polish our brains against others. Mm-hmm. Rub and polish our brains. You don't get any friction again, by sort of just agreeing, agreeing, agreeing. In fact, the research has shown that if you are surrounded by people who already agree with you, your opinions only become sort of more what they are. Mm-hmm. They kind of go in that direction and go further and further and further and further, which explains polarization in some ways. Mm-hmm. So something else I wanna bring up is um, a friend of mine here in Washington state, a philosophy professor, David Smith, teaches this course on um, civility in an angry time. And he mm-hmm. asks these two really important questions that I think are brilliant. The first one is, can you admit that you're wrong about something? And the second one is, what do you value more, the truth or your own beliefs? If you can admit that you're wrong about something, but you don't know what, and if you can admit that you value the truth more than your own beliefs, that's it, you're open. You must be open. You have to have an inquiring mind. Mm -hmm. You have to stay open. So one other thing that I want to share because uh, partisan and party stuff came up, Um, 2019 Pew survey showed that 53% of Republicans and 45% of Democrats said the other party, quote, has almost no good ideas. Uh, That's a 10 percentage point jump for both groups since 2016. Um, How many of us think the other side has some good ideas? 17% of Republicans and 13% of Democrats. It's, It's not, you know, it's like the animosity is what's pushing us away. The psychology is what's pushing us away. The, the certainty is what's pushing us away. You know, are there straight up evil ideologies? Absolutely. But what I hear people say is because they're so afraid mm. that they'll figure out they're talking to a Nazi, better not to talk to anyone with conservative ideas <laughs> at all if you're blue. Just better not to even put yourself at risk. And it's like, really? <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah. that, that comes back to fear. We are so afraid of each other. My God, you know, how did, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I love that. And um, yeah, I could just stay and listen to you two talk to each other like for the rest of the evening and I would be really happy. Um, Lexi, I want to come back to you because uh, I, so I want to get into this. I, I think that everything you just said, Monica, is totally true. And there is this whole dynamic around platforming, particularly around, uh, that's especially strong in the sort of Gen Z youth cohort. And uh, Braver Angels has certainly come under pressure to to not platform certain people um, or certain ideas, moreover. And um, so curiosity, we'll get into the, uh, we'll dive into the, how do you do this personally even more a little bit later, but I want us uh, to zoom out and look at the societal level for a minute. And Lexi, you have written beautifully about, um, well, so your, your newsletter is called Civic Renaissance, right? And you, uh, I think the first time we met, you told me that your dream is to, uh, so as, as you all are probably picking up, Lexi is one of those people who like quotes Renaissance thinkers you've never heard of. And you're like, oh yeah, totally. Um, and she, uh, uh, so you told me that your dream was like, what if we could live, what, what if we could spark that in America again? What if we could um, live that out in our lifetime? Um, what would it take to spark that and to lead it? And so I'm interested if you can speak a little bit to the mm-hmm. civic renaissance that you envision and to what would it take to create a culture of curiosity, right? To like have this, um, to move from a society that worries about deplatforming to one that is deeply curious and, and takes this really seriously. That's an extraordinary question, April. Thank you. You know, when you look at these high watermarks of human achievement, these renaissances, like there is the renaissance that people are familiar with, they associate it with Italy and and 14th, 15th century Florence, but there have been many renaissances in human history and not just in the West, also in the East. Like there are a few factors that, um, you know, 
conflate to allow uh, eras of, of um, human ingenuity and proliferation of creativity, like unlocking human potential in beautiful ways. Um, and uh, uh, one of those things is leaders that care about that, you know, like it, it, uh, for, for most of human history, renaissances have been an elite thing, really like, you know, um, uh, the Carolingian, Carolingian Renaissance, Charlemagne, like put a lot of effort into education and allowing education to be a little bit more democratized. And uh, the Medici's patronized uh, Da Vinci and Michelangelo. Um, and, and it was kind of an elite thing where, where uh, people invested in, in, in people to, uh, to allow them to create and produce and write and, and paint. But um, what's interesting about our moment today, we have more, we are wealthier, we have more leisure time, and we have access to more, and we're more literate, we're more educated, um, and we have access to more information than any other society in human history. Like, what an extraordinary thing. Like, we don't have, it doesn't have to be an elite thing anymore for a renaissance to happen. This, we can start this, we can do this in our everyday. It's like, we have Wikipedia, we have smartphones, and we have conversations like this. There's, there's like, I've just been so impressed by the um, spontaneous, uh, great programming that people have just put together over the pandemic where we're not able to meet in person, but they're just, you know, we're putting together conversations like this. Um, and, and what a remarkable opportunity that offers that, um, uh, to, for each of us to, to kind of be a part of an, a, a, a broader culture of Renaissance, but but in our own lives, maybe just you know altering mm -hmm. habits in our everyday how we how we nourish our minds and hearts and and um, and as we nourish our minds and hearts, it gives us a little bit more um, equanimity and, and and joy and moral fortitude to maybe have a little bit more grace to have some of the um, tricky conversations and, and challenging conversations that Monica. Um, was was talking about a little bit ago, but like kind of the, seeing curiosity as a form of self care. Like we are mind, body, spirit. We are not just political animals. Like we mm. we're, we're, we're tripartite. Um, and so I I'm I'm encouraged by that opportunity before us. That's what I see, and I even see the pandemic as an opportunity in this way, because we're at, a, we're at kind of an inflection point. Like, I think we know as a country what we don't want anymore. And, and we're eager for something new. Like we don't wanna be in a world that's locked down and um, you know, held hostage by a pathogen. And, and we're, I, we've been isolated, we've been lonely. We, we miss mm -hmm. friendship, we miss community. And I think we're all ready to kind of reflect what does that mean and how can we, when we have our freedom again, when we have community again, what, how are we going to make the most of that? And, and, and um, so I'm I'm really excited for the opportunity. That's that's part of what civic renaissance is about. Uh, just just to to provide and not just you know me sharing information with you, but to provide a, a venue for that sort of intellectual community that can see us through the end of the pandemic, but also beyond as we're thinking, what is this world made new? This post pandemic era, what does it look like, and what could it be? I am so excited about that. Really inspired by it, and um, and. and and curious to hear what you guys think. Yeah, well, I, I would welcome questions about that when we get to the Q&A section soon. And yeah, you've inspired me, <laughs> Lexi. Like I, <laughs> I'm all about that. Let's live in that world. Let's make that world. Um, I, uh, sorry to be a downer, but I do just have to ask like, what are, what's stopping us, right? Like what are the impediments? Um, I think that there are some barriers and Mani, you mentioned some of them earlier with regard to the, the need for us to be able to hold uncertainty and the, it's so much easier, right? To grab onto one of the many tantalizing certainties being offered us. Um, and yeah, I'm just interested sort of on a, a societal level. What, what are those things that are holding us back? Monica, we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, one that I definitely want to bring up is the way in which we have conversations hmm. is extraordinarily limiting and we don't think about it. Basically, as human beings, we have this amazing toolbox for communication and it involves everything from face to voice to pacing to animation and passionate feelings. <laughs> you know, all that. Um, and yeah, then Ronnie. somehow the lion's share of our actual word, right, are typed out on our phones. And we try to communicate who we are because that's really ultimately all we really try to communicate is we all just wanna be heard. That's it. We all just wanna be heard and seen and loved. And um, so this way that we communicate with social media profiles where our opinions become our stand-in for our identity block us 
we the internet just completely obscures the person. And one of the reasons I think that's so important to curiosity has to do with um, another fun thing from the research, a fun concept to, to throw out there is, and this comes from a researcher named Jordan Lipman. There is uh, eye curiosity, interest-based curiosity, and there is deprivation curiosity, de-curiosity. Deprivation curiosity just wants to solve that one thing. When am I going to get a vaccine? When am I going to hug my friends again? If I just have that answer, I'm done. I just need to solve that and we're done, right? Interest-based curiosity is what happened to me at a restaurant in Hawaii uh, a while ago, like last time I could take a vacation, where we ran into a restaurant called Fleetwoods. And my waiter told me that it's called Fleetwoods because it's owned by one of the members of Fleetwood Mac. I am a huge shameless soft rock fan. And I'm like, no way. And on my way home and all that night, I read everything I could on Wikipedia about rumors, the album, about the sex and the drugs. And I got so curious and into Fleetwood Mac. And it was like a never ending drive. So why do I bring that up? Because when it comes to what we're curious about, we have sort of two options about how we want to see the information gaps that we can chase. And one of them is puzzles. A puzzle is something that you know how to put together. You just need to find the pieces. So, you know, you find that last piece, you plug it in, you're done. Puzzle solved. Let's move on. And then there's mysteries. If we train our brains on mysteries, we will be curious for longer. We will have the resilience to replace one question that is kind of answered with the next one and the next one and the next one. And here's the cool part. The deepest and most amazing source of mystery in our world is people. So the reason I brought up the internet is because the internet makes it about opinion, makes it about logic and makes it about ideas, all of which are lovely, right? Like that's great, but it completely removes us from people. And when we are able to use our conversation and communication toolbox at the utmost, at 100%, right now we're close, but we're not actually in the room. We can't sense the energy of the room and the audience. Like I wish we could, and someday we will again. But at that point, like, man, you know, people, people are mysteries. And, and, and we start to go, this, this conversation isn't just about curiosity. It's also about like Lexi and what's in her brain and mm -hmm. why she's even to do what she's doing. And once mm -hmm. that mystery gets lodged in your brain, you're in for the long haul, you know, you're going to release some insights everywhere. It's going to be awesome. So yeah, that was like a long winded way of saying the way in which we have conversations are so limited and remove us from the mystery of people that can keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling us and even make us sort of connect and fall in love. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's beautiful. Lexi, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I, I just, what that reminds me of Lonnie is, I was thinking before this panel, like when have I, um, is there shallow curiosity and deep curiosity? And I think there are. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me, I so I worked for um, David Brooks at the New York Times for about five years before I uh, came over to Braver Angels. And one of, um, <laughs> you know how like you read different things and you work on different ideas over time and like some of them just really grab you and stick with you and like they just stay and one of the ones that uh was like that for me was a column by David in uh that we worked on in like I think it was like 2014 or something um yeah it was 2014 called Stairway to Wisdom and what it talked about was exactly what you're naming Mani that like the 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 sort of arc of the column is if you really wanted to deeply understand something how do you go about it? And so the stairway conceit is you start with data, right? And you can see certain things from that. Um, the article uses teen pregnancy as a, um, a sort of example. Uh, so you can see that that's fallen, right? Uh, rates have fallen. And then one level above that, you go to uh, academic understanding and um, just sort of the research and, and the theories and sort of, and from that you can glean a picture of, um, uh, sort of what uh, general groups do and what sort mm -hmm. of overall trends you can name. Um, but beyond that, um, the, so academics often think they're superior to journalists, of course, Monty, I'm, I'm sure you have no experience with that whatsoever. Um, I say this is the, the journalist daughter of two academics, but anyway, the, um, uh, but actually Brooks argues that um, the, uh, that journalism is actually superior in a certain way because it respects the, um, the daunting and uh, just infinite 
uh, mystery of the individual and the it, it in, enables you to tell a particular story, right? Because there's this um, quote I like in here, we all know people whose lives are breathtakingly unpredictable, right? A Mormon leader who came out of the closet and became a gay dad, an investment banker who became a nun, et cetera, et cetera. And that when you follow individual stories, um, that's where you can really find truth. And that also, for what it's worth, back on political polarization, that's some of the answer there too, right? Because real life is much more purple or, I don't know, pink or whatever color, right? It's it's not, nobody lives a red life or a blue life. It's not possible. And so the um, individuals really are, are where that comes in. And then Brooks ends the column with, uh, in his view, the highest way of knowing, uh, which is actually love, that without, and so Augustine is the, as Brooks calls it, the master teacher on this subject. And you can't know something um, at, at the deepest level without intimacy. And so um, I studied anthropology in college, and this is the the one critique I have of it is that you're supposed to be objective, right? You're mm -hmm. you're not supposed to fall in love with the thing you're understanding. But I think that um, one of the things that curiosity can do for us, right, is it can give us the chance to fall in love with mm -hmm. any number of uh, phenomena in the world, right? People, uh, places, all kinds of, um, and almost anything you run across uh, is an opportunity if curiosity is one of the things that makes you open to the possibility of loving it. And so uh, Lexi, I'm interested if you have any thoughts on sort of barriers um, and and what could really drive us towards the ability to, to be open. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll get into uh, what exactly it, it takes to do this in day-to-day -day life. Hmm. April, that was so exquisitely uh, said. Thank you for that overview of that great mm -hmm. Brooks column. It's David more than me. But yes, no, sure. but it's, it's beautiful. Um, you know, Augustine has this concept of ordering our loves that we're not born loving what we ought to love. We're born selfish. We're born loving ourselves. And that's what education does. That's what, you know, religion does. That's what, that's what soul craft is. Education in its traditional form was soul craft. It was character education that was teaching us or ordering our loves, the ordo amore. That's that's the uh, um, and and what we should love are our others. We should love people, and that's something not something that's that that we're naturally inclined to do. Um, it's e it's easier. It's more comfortable to um, to just sit in our self righteousness, or even you know, end a friendship and and be alone, even if it if it means we're right. That's the, that's sometimes the comfortable um, thing to do. I love um, a, a, a aphorism from one of my favorite lesser known thinkers. One day. I want to write a uh, popular biography of him, introducing the world to this forgotten um, soul that has so much wisdom for our current moment, Blaise Pascal. He was this incredible scientific, mathematical genius mind. He invented the first kind of computer calculator, first like omnibus system in Paris, um, kind of first public transit, just innovator in a million different ways, million different fields, just brilliant, beyond brilliant. Um, and he has this, and he ended up having a radical conversion experience. Um, and I don't necessarily condone his life. He sat alone in a room for like the last decade of his life, just like thinking about God and like nothing else, a little bit extreme, <laughs> but he's a beautiful, beautiful soul. We have today his, um, his pensée, they're called, um, a book of, of just his thoughts. Cause he never wrote a book. He died at early death at age 39 before finishing um, his book. But one of his aphorisms that is so beautiful beautiful that really resonates with um, or echoes what April said is uh, la cour de sa raison, la raison ne connaît pas. The heart has reasons that reason cannot understand, like to, that we learn through the heart and that's not going to, um, and, 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 and there are just some things that, that data, like no, you know, not, not enough spreadsheets, not enough experiments, they'll, they'll, we'll never understand them in the same way as, um, as, as, um, as we will, when we love something. And I mean, that just talking about barriers to curiosity, like just reorienting our loves towards just loving our fellow citizens, loving, loving our fellow man and loving one another, like our neighbors more than than our prize and wanting to be right all the time. Because I think, you know, we, we taught a lot, talk, talked a lot about moral certainty um, and how it's just, it's comfortable to be certain in our own rightness. Like we desperately want to be, be good and be right and, you know, feel, feel like co confident in that knowledge. Um, but just, yeah, just to stay, to stay open, to stay wondrous about the world, uh, to um, counteract these 
it feels like innumerable forces that keep us, you know, in the in this sort of dichotomy of black and white, right or wrong, good and evil, um, and and kind of getting outside of that, taking a walk, like um, enjoying nature, looking up at the sky at night, like seeing how small we are and how insignificant our, our problems are, like looking up at, at space and just thinking about the vastness of space never ceases to like inspire me with utter awe about how little I know about the world and how small my problems and like my frustrations and anxieties are um, in light of that. So just doing things habitually um, to kind of clarify our clarify our palette. I liked uh, Monica, you talked about curiosity as this thirst, like that's um, analogical to our bodily, like we're, we're, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we need that. Um, and I mean, as we go to Quinchar, like we, we um, we are kind of vac vacuous, like we, we want to fill our, our hearts and minds with something and we will we will fill them with something, but to fill it with high quality stuff, like not not junk food to kind of go, like not to just be on Twitter all night, like that's not gonna sustain us in the long run and in the same way that a walk or, you know, reading a good book or having a conversation with a good friend um, might. So uh, many barriers, but also many, many options um, to kind of keep, keep curious and keep nourishing our minds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's a perfect transition because so you named several things there, right? That that one can actually do in regular life to to nourish curiosity. And I like how you linked it to wonder. Um, I think that there is something about uh, just getting a sort of like a, a daily dose of of wonder, right? Of something that is beyond you and yeah. and just sort of lifts you for a moment out of your pedestrian everyday little, you know, uh, get the kids to school kind of life. And um, yeah, going out in the nature, there are all sorts of different people have different ways of getting there. You, I know, get it primarily through Blaise Pascal. Um, not all of us do, but the uh, uh, for me, it's um, definitely nature, but also poetry. Like just, there are certain, like I can read a single sentence and like, it can just like take me out for uh, for a little ride in the, the world of beauty just for a second. And uh, prayer is a great way to do that too. I don't know. There are all sorts of things, but a daily dose of wonder is one of the things I'm taking away from what yes, you said. I love that. And uh, Mani, I, I'm once again going to pick on you um, and take us from sort of the, the beautiful uh, ethereal notion of wonder down to like the down and dirty in human affairs. Um, and and again, it's I ask you this because I, I trust you to have the... Um, depth and deafness to answer. But so one of the things you shared, uh, Monica, for those of you who didn't see it, was our keynote speaker at the um, the gathering we held the day after the election this past November. And uh, she spoke very movingly of how she had watched the election with her parents, even though um, she certainly does not support President Trump and uh, they very much do. And I, I still admire that, Monica. Like, I don't know, like, election results like I understand watching movies with them, but like whoa that's like that's like two levels up from my ability to I also have a, a politically divided family although it goes the other direction anyway the um I'm interested in how you so how do you uh think about curiosity with regard to like that very intimate conflict how does that how do you live it out um do you like does it work um I'm sure it's not always easy tell us about that yeah, so my parents, uh, the, the dinner party trick in Seattle, which is a very blue, that's where I'm from. And, you know, yeah, it's very, very blue town is, uh, you know, to walk into a group of newish friends and to say politics comes up, Trump comes up. And I say my parents are Mexican immigrants who voted for Trump, uh, in fact, twice. And, uh, you know, I'm blue. And so I didn't. And so everyone just kind of stops and goes, huh? You know what? What? How does that even compute? I've talked to my mom so much about, and my dad, about politics, about everything. Uh, over the summer, they brought up all kinds of conversations we, we just had about race, uh, hours long. I remember one day she, she called and just had a question and I mentioned something she had posted on Facebook and we were off. And maybe three and a half hours later, you know, I come up and my husband had made dinner for the kids even though I was supposed to and all that. So I, I've asked her several times, what she thinks makes it work. How is it that this can work? Because we, we are very different on these things. And we, the, converse, the result of the conversation is not agreement. And we know that, and that's not what we're trying to get. And, and she always says a version of the same thing. And I've, 
the more that we practice this, the more I realize how right she is, which is that, you know, she'll go, Monica, well, what you and I do for each other is we acknowledge when the other makes good points. And so the reason I think this is so wise and profound is that usually when we approach conversations with people who disagree with us, we come in shields up. I'm a Star Trek fan, shields up. <laughs> and so shields up means I'm, I got a poker face over here, right? If there's anything that you're saying that is me, reaching my heart or starting to turn something in my head, hell no, I'm not gonna admit it to you. What is that? No, you know, this is a battle. This is about like, I hold up my shield, you hit me on sword, I come over from over here. And that's just not our conversations. Our conversations are explorations. They are not violent, they are not aggressive, and they are not shields up. They're the opposite, they're very vulnerable. And so I think this is a skill I've developed as a journalist because, and I was told this early in my career, for whatever reason, I'm pretty good at getting people to feel comfortable telling me about themselves. I think that that ends up being really important. The way that I define listening is showing people they matter. That can be a really, really hard thing to do. Um, but, but it's that, it's uh, like if you've ever worked at a team, uh, you know, at work at an office or whatever, um, and you're going through a really hard project or a hard thing you're trying to do together. If you don't celebrate the small wins, mm -hmm. everything will stall. And th this goes back to the curiosity engine I was talking about. If, if you don't name for the other person that they have said something and you can hook onto it in a surprising way you didn't expect, again, doesn't mean you're agreeing with them. That's not the point at all. All it means is that your two brains and hearts are calibrating. Just mm. you're seeing each other's humanity. You're seeing the validity of each other's experiences and values. That's it, right? You're just seeing their story. That's it. I love, I love what Blaise Pascal said. The heart has reasons that reason can't understand, right? Mm. We try to explain everything reasonably. <laughs> you can't, you can't do it. You cannot do it. And you certainly can't do it with shields up. So that I think is the key to why me and my mom and my dad can have these incredible conversations because they're explorations. We know we love each other. None's gonna head, none's gonna, Trump isn't gonna get in the middle of that. That's not happening. <laughs> um, and it's like laughable to us that it, that it could. But, but we are so afraid of each other. We're so afraid to encounter the devil in each other that, um, that we go in shields up. We don't celebrate the small wins. We don't acknowledge when something the other person said, has said has landed in any way. And so there's no traction. There's no traction. And eventually you just give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that really quickly? Please. Well, yes. I, and I, I, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm just going to remind folks that we're switching to Q&A in a second. So start getting your questions ready. Go ahead, Lexi. <laughs> um, Monica, that was so powerful that there's no way you're going to let politics divide something as beautiful and precious as a, a, a family relationship. And I mean, this is an advice that I always follow myself. Like I have people in my family that I disagree with vehemently on politics. Um, so much so that I kind of just decide not to talk about it with them. Like it's just not even worth having the conversation. And yet I still find myself getting myself getting frustrated when <laughs> somehow the conversation comes back that way and it's like triggering. And, and um, so uh, there's a Stoic philosopher named um, Epictetus. Um, and, and he said that the best thing we can learn from Socrates is how to have a disagreement with someone without descending into a quarrel. And what did he mean by that? Well, Socrates is famous for asking questions, right? Like, and, and asking questions is the opposite of coming in with shields up, as Monica said, like coming in with all the answers and like, you know, I know what you believe, like, and, and, you know, Socrates was a gadfly. He asked questions. He pointed out hypocrisy and he pointed out contradictions. He did all these things uh, and ultimately got him killed. <laughs> but uh, the point is like, there is a, there is a way to, um, there is a way to, um, yeah, come in, without knowing all the answers and, and just kind of inter interrogating. And, and that just shows interest and, and, um, and, and openness to, to maybe learning something. Because I do believe that there is no situation that we can't learn in. <laughs> There's no one we can't learn something from. And there, there has been a whole you know, proliferation of self-help self books on how to win friends and influence people and, and get people to like you. And frankly, I think that 
the most interesting people in the, in the room are the interested people. They're the curious mm -hmm. ones, the people that are interested in you. They're the people that want to, like, as, as Monica said, have, have this baseline of knowledge and, and know, know the questions to ask. So I, I, I love what you said, Monica. Um, you know, you're not going to let politics get in the way of, of, of relationship and, and just, to, just to ask questions. And by the way, before anyone, just real quick, before anyone thinks that these conversations are just like peaceful little kumbayas. No. <laughs> that day we were watching the election results, holy <laughs> hell. Like we have like, <laughs> hell in my mother's living room. And like, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean, when, you know how people get so mad that they storm out of a room? I don't do that. That's just like not in me. <laughs> I did it that night. I did it that night. And I was like, wow, this is like oh, a wow. movie. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. And then I came back in and they were like, Ugh. and it was actually something Trump was saying on screen like when he finally kind of mm. gave up, came up and gave his speech. And I was like, <laughs> and my parents were like, he's done, Monica. You can come back. <laughs> but, uh, and all kinds of things that night where we just yelled, 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 and then like had another bite of ice cream, you know, just. Mm -hmm. stayed with it it's not about not mm -hmm. showing compassion it's certainly not about hiding um, yeah listening is hiding listening is not hiding it's not no 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 absolutely yeah yeah I um I'm glad you you said what you just said Monica because um you know it's fun to make light of these things but like I'll be honest like so I have the opposite situation that my parents are blue and I'm red and like that has been really uh, a source of tension and not just because we like disagree about policy but because um i don't know i think there's been a question around like am i rejecting them uh by becoming religious and conservative when they are the, the opposite of those things like and and so i feel like one of the things that has been useful in my case and again just trying to think about like how do you do this in real life like how do you live as a curious person and like do this um personally uh I think that um, I haven't, <laughs> my family doesn't do the like, we all yell at each other and then it's fine. Thing. <laughs> It'd be sort of nice if we did. Um, but I have found that like what works for my family is, um, and, and particularly around curiosity is, um, is first of all, to try to get to the root of things. So talk about what you're really talking about. And so if it's, um, me feeling like you don't think I'm still your daughter, but I'm still your daughter, right? Like talk about that. Don't have it be, if if that all gets sort of fought out in a proxy battle, but economic policy, that doesn't help anybody, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that one of the things curiosity can do is it can peel back layers of that onion and get to like, what are we, what is really going on here? And um, and the other is uh, the thing that, but, and, and sometimes it is about policy and that's fine too, right? But like, really investigating um, where that's coming from. And, and honestly, every time, I will say, this has not been easy, but every time I've really tried to ask my parents where, ask over, like follow the line of questions down until I really know where they're coming from. It's actually really compelling and inspiring. And it's usually, so like my mother is um, someone who grew up in a working class household and, and there's been a real clear line in my family forever of don't forget where we came from. And mm -hmm. um, so then when she talks about economic policy, she's an economist. Um, and and she, like, if I ask enough questions, I understand, like, where is her heart in this? And it's always somewhere that I like, admire, ultimately, yes. like, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with the conclusions. But and, and the last thing I would say is just mm -hmm. that all that takes a bunch of courage and a bunch of hanging in there and a bunch of like um, coming back after Trump's done with his speech to keep having ice cream because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let no one here pretend that this is not complicated. Um, so with that, um, I would love to go to questions. Um, mm -hmm. And it's unusually appropriate because we're talking about curiosity. And all right, Mr. Crowley, you've done an excellent job. Yours was the first hand I saw. <laughs> Go ahead and ask us your, unmute yourself and ask us your question. Hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate the um, excitement around the idea of curiosity because I get myself pretty excited a lot <laughs> and um, it's nice to see other people excited about it. Um, and I, and you know, throughout your discussion, I was thinking about what, since it's such an attractive idea in many ways, you know, loving knowledge and sort of um, recognizing the limits of certainty and having comfort with complexity and um, avoiding easy answers and 
being aware of your strong convictions. I mean, it sounds like something we should all embrace. Um, but I feel like there are these barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if there are some people who are more vulnerable to defensiveness, you know, um, in, uh, in, in, in response to the challenge to be more curious. I'm wondering if there's some of it. So for example, I think about like concepts by Robin D'Angelo called white fragility, mm -hmm. which as a white, you know, cisgendered um, male, uh, I have experienced that um, historically and know people who have experienced that, this idea that we're sort of, um, a, we don't tend to have an open mind in conversations that challenge the system of racism in America. And we could talk about whether so, there is that such a system, <laughs> but yeah. I like where you're going. I'm gonna ask you to, to come to, to wrap it up real quick. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just wondering about whether you see any barriers mm -hmm. that exist in some people more than others and how do we how do we do a better job at breaking down some of those barriers thank you great thanks um monica any thoughts that is a oh gosh that's a really good question and i'm glad you brought up the the illustrations you brought up so uh, the way in my framework that I think about the places where we are stuck and the reason we're so divided and how that affects us on the individual level uh, is what I call SOS, uh, like help, SOS, sorting, othering, and siloing. Uh, so because of this divisive time, uh, we are sorting ourselves even more into groups of like-minded people. It's that concept is traditionally a physical one, right? We live in cities with other blues and in towns with other reds or whatever, but it's even more enhanced by the digital sorting into Facebook groups and what have you. Then we have othering. Othering is this way that we dehumanize the other. Whoever we don't agree with, we just don't see them as us. Uh, and that becomes a real problem. And it turns out it takes very little to see that. And we do that all the time. Um, and then finally, siloing. Siloing is where uh, sort of as a result of the first two, sorting and othering, you end up just existing in a little cocoon of, uh, you know, reflections that get echoed and refracted and amplified and you're just, ah, and your anxiety goes up. So when you ask the question about defensiveness, un unfortunately, and I hesitate to say this because I'm not sure, I'm not sure about anything I'm saying tonight, by the way, I want that to be clear. <laughs> but, but I do believe that the more time we spend in the loudest parts of our silos, the more anxiety we will build up about leaving them, about crossing divides and talking to people who see things differently at all. And that fear, that anxiety, we, we think the world is actually burning right now all around us. And I'm sure many of us have probably been there. We can go in and out of that mode. So I see it as very contextual. I don't think it's permanent. Uh, and I don't think it's tied to personality. I think it's contextual. When you believe that the stakes are extraordinarily high and that you cannot afford to, to, to see someone on the other side as potentially interesting because, because they are harming people and it's all going downhill. And if I even entertain a conversation with them, then, oh my gosh, I am the enemy. I'm a horrible person, whatever, right? Like we feel this, we feel this. And so I think it's about that because the second that you peel away, right? You do a little digital detox, you turn off the news for a minute and you spend a day or two just in actual real life conversation with people and you go, maybe it's, maybe it's not quite so dire. The mm. stakes go down, your curiosity comes up. So I would mm -hmm. say it is, it is largely contextual. Um, and we can talk about some of the stereotypes. There are, there's a horrible stereotype that I run into a lot among other blues that say conservatives are less curious. BS, that's some BS, <laughs> just not true at all. <laughs> like I have encountered how untrue that is, but unfortunately a lot of folks who are blue so sometimes believe that. And I'm sure that conservatives have some stereotypes about uh, blues curiosity or, or, you know, I know that there's more than, than just that example, but, but no, I think it's context driven. And the science shows us anxiety makes us think that it's more work than it's worth to get curious. The more anxious we get, the less curious we will be. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. Next, I'd like to go to uh, Herb. Herb, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and love to hear your question. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, so uh, 
first of all, I, I thank you for this opportunity and I thank you for this uh, forum. But the difficulty that I'm having is when it comes to your life. So we talk about politics mm -hmm. and we talk about some of these things and it makes it sound it's this thing that you can, that, that's out there. But for a lot of us, this is literally our day-to-day -day lives. When I walk out the door, will I come back? When mm -hmm. I see blue lights in the in, in back of my car, you know, what's gonna happen, you know? I've got friends who are getting UTIs because they're afraid to go to the bathroom because they're, they're gonna be harassed um, because of um, their, their, their transgender status. Um, so these are people's actual lives that I'm talking about. And that when other people are talking about some of these things and saying some of these things, they're, they're not coming from that particular point. It's, it's a political thing, it's whatever, it's, it's out there. So when somebody, you know, Alexandra mentioned about slavery, I have people who actually still believe that slavery is okay. I know people who actually have said that, that if they could, they would definitely own slaves today. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, that's a very tough one. Um, if either of you wanna chime in, feel free. I, I wanna offer one thing real quick, which is, um, first of all, I really appreciate you, ask, you asking that question. And in full disclosure, um, when I thought about this panel, I thought about how challenging it was gonna be to talk about something something on the positive side of all this when we're surrounded by, <laughs> the world we're surrounded by right now. And you're absolutely right that uh, it's not the same to invite people to be curious if, um, when they're in positions of actual like very immediate risk, um, not the same at all. And I, I guess I would say um, that the, there's a place to, uh, to point people towards curiosity and a place not to, right? There are times and places and many of the contexts you're describing are not the right time or place. Um, I would also say though that the, um, so I've done a lot of work with sexual violence survivors and there is just, it is just the case that relationships heal people. It's much harder to heal alone than it is to heal in relationship. And so, and that doesn't have to be a relationship with the person who has done you harm, with uh, your oppressor, anything like that, but it has to be a relationship with someone. And so I think that trust plays a part in healing and in the renewal and recovery um, of people who are deeply vulnerable uh, and, and have been subjected to serious uh, harm as well. Um, so that's my thought on that. Um, just because we have so many hands up, I think we're gonna go to the next question. Uh, and we will go to uh, Mark Wong. Mark, go ahead and unmute and ask us your question. Um, personal growth happens when we accomplish something that we never thought we were able to. So one example is when someone runs their first marathon and it helps people uh, realize that they're stronger and more capable of growth than they, than they ever realized. Now, personal growth can also happen when we understand other people or an idea that we never thought we were able to. And that also makes us more confident and it builds our perspective muscles. It makes it more flexible. It helps us do it again in the future. And it's something we all need to do more often. And there's also, now this also ties into a can-do attitude. What is can-do attitude? What is it? It's putting aside our doubts, doing the actual work, and then achieving things that are, that are uh, unachievable or surprising to us. And we need to have a can understand and respect others attitude. Put aside our doubts, do the actual work, and then we can often understand people in ways we never imagined we could. Now- I ask you to come to your question, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I actually don't have a question and I have a couple more points, but uh, I don't actually-, actually have a question. So, <laughs> I understand that this is the time for questions. And so I think I'll just invite Lexi, invite you to respond to that as um, a prompt. I, I, love, every, question mark. I love everything that he said. <laughs> Growth comes <laughs> after challenge. <laughs> I think it's, it's, um, it's beautiful um, when we put ourselves out there, when we are out, when we, you know, take risks outside of our comfort zone, whether it's relationally uh, or emotionally, like asking a question when we'd rather kind of stay uh, in the complacency and certainty of our own, uh, of our own knowledge. And, and then we learn something new and it's really rewarding. Or we, or we have a friendship, we make a bid for affection, we, you know, it, it develops 
develops into a friendship where we, um, or even if it's just a personal goal, like he mentioned running a marathon, you know, like that, that it's, it's, uh, you know, building that, that self-confidence and, and, and do we talk about this already? That, that curiosity is iterative. Like the more, you know, the mm. more you want to know. And, and that, um, it does, it de- and, and that, you know, building the, that confidence in small ways, hopefully leads to, um, you know, be building confidence in bigger ways and asking b- bigger questions of of ourselves and and those around us and, and of society so uh i i love everything that the gentleman said <laughs> <laughs> spectacular um yes jazz hands absolutely uh, lovely let's go to um rita chisholm go ahead and unmute yourself and ask us your question good evening everyone i'm calling from central arkansas can you hear me okay <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to just give an illustration of some of the things that has, have been shared tonight. Very short illustration, but very, very impactful to me when I was a, a young girl in, I believe it must have been in junior high. Um, I was one that came from a home that unkindness was not tolerated regardless. Uh, I, we were taught that Other people were human beings just like we were and that, you know, in our, in our paradigm, God made everyone and that we should respect that, that they were, you know, they were children of God. So that was two things. Truth and kindness were just monumental. Um, I can remember coming home from school one day and talking to my parents about, and I don't even recall what it was. It was about a girl, about someone at school. And my, my, I guess it was my father that looked at me and he just asked me a simple question. And he said, do you know that girl? And I looked at him, I was confused. And I said, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I know. What do you mean, do I know her? I, yeah, I know her, she goes to school with me. He said, no, he said, do you know that girl? And what he was trying to engender in me was the fact that what we see on the exterior or what we think we know about people, we really don't. And that we need to be curious. And just because one friend said something about- I'm gonna invite you to come to your question. Mm -hmm. No, there is no question. That is the point. Ah, we We have to be curious enough that we don't trust someone else, not only because of that, but because the personalities the dynamics between personalities are entirely mm-hmm. different between two people. All righty. Um, you know, so that, gonna... that's my <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that we are, this is a time for questions. And so I'm going to put a question mark at the end of that one too. And um, specifically, actually, I'd like to, the, the thing I want to know about that is um, either Monica or Lexi, talk to me a little bit about what it means to know somebody, right? Like, what does it mean to... Uh, and how does curiosity relate to that? And and what does that look like? Yeah, mm-hmm. there's um, uh, a Scottish word <laughs> that is considered a fossil word, fun, fun fact, <laughs> uh, as it is no longer in use except for one idiom. The word is ken. It's not the name ken, it's the concept ken. And it's a mm-hmm. nautical ken. Um, and uh, way back in the day, Scottish sailors would talk about their ken being the distance from the boat to as far as they could see on the horizon. So there's a phrase that emerged from that uh, that is still used in Scotland called beyond one's ken. When something is beyond one's view, it is beyond one's ken, it is beyond one's knowing. You can't see it. What I love about that concept is usually we don't consider, we don't think of knowledge as something that has natural bounds based on the fact that we are just one pair of eyes living one life one path informed by our experiences, you know, uh, infused with meaning thanks to our unique values. We don't see all of the world. We see in a fraction of the world. And the concept of Ken, I think gives, gives me this incredible humility about, I will never know someone. Again, people are mysteries, you never know mm. someone. I've been married to my husband for, you know, 11 years and he's the most confounding human being to me on the planet. <laughs> I mean, like people are endless, bottomless, um, bottomless mysteries. So, but of course, in a, in a practical sense, the, the way that you know someone the least is by making assumptions about them, by mm-hmm. making assumptions about them based on what you read 
that comes mm. to you from your silos and comes with some sheen of credibility. This was a study about, about you know, the people who believe those things. 35% of them are this. Oh, let's assume a hundred thousand things about them based on that. And let's now be like, you know, uh, take them a certain way and have a certain approach. But, but, I'm, but I'm glad you brought up knowledge. Knowledge is a tough one. Um, but, but knowing you can't ever truly know someone and that's part of the beauty of life. That's part of the beauty of relationships. We'd get bored otherwise, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, so it, that's why I think that people, if you make the focus of your curiosity a person, um, people in general, the conversation may never end. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're running a little short on time and I'm gonna try to squeeze in two more questions if we can. Um, I want to go to Silas Kulkarni uh, in hopes that you're going to sing us your question because I see that guitar. Please unmute and then sing your question. <laughs> I will not be singing my question, but um, I appreciate <laughs> okay, the invitation. Fine. Um, and I, I have, but I have been serenading you all in my heart. Um, so, um, uh, my question was about power. Um, it seems like the principles that that uh, the panelists have all laid out um, have all been related to interpersonal relationships and and curiosity in getting to know someone else or, or in a field of knowledge. But it seems like a lot of what polarizes us has to do with with contests of power. We're we're we're, we're wrestling for control of society, um, and so it seems to me really different to ask like you know what do you Lexi want to uh, uh, understand that I don't understand than to, than to ask what do you Mitch McConnell understand that I don't understand because. Mitch McConnell is not playing an honest best game of like, let's see, seek the truth. Or maybe he is, maybe I'm judging mm, him careful. harshly. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm judging him harshly. <laughs> careful, using, yes. Using his, him as an example of, of, of a political actor. Um, it, it seems to me that his, 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 his goal is to get power for his side as, as you know, whether Nancy Pelosi or whoever other all the Democrats you can choose on their side with. So I guess my question is, does the same principle of curiosity apply to people who are playing the power game, not the truth game? Hmm. Interesting. Lexi? Yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, and it reminds me of, um, of the reality that when power is exercised and when, when one person, one party coerces another, that it okay. hurts. Are you able to work out, babe? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it hurts the person who both is coerced, but it also hurts the soul of the person exerting that power. Um, and, and it reminds me that curiosity is fundamentally uh, something that has to be among equals, people that see themselves as more like than unlike. And of course, you know, you can be curious in a learning environment like a classroom where there's a person in authority and there's a, who presumably knows more and then there's a student who knows less. But I think the best teachers um, are ones that also kind of learn from students as well and the ones that are also still open to learning. Um, so I think that curiosity can very, very well exist within within power dynamics that are that are healthy like there will always be hierarchy there will always be rank and authority that's just a fact of human life and but just just bearing in mind like I, I mean there are so many intellectual experiences like roundtable discussions that I love going to um, with the Aspen Institute or just all these organizations that, that allow for kind of forms of conversation and I've recommended these different forms of conversation to pretty famous people I know, people that, um, that, I, that I, I've learned a lot from, that, I, that, that um, have taught me a lot. And when, when, they, when they say to me like, oh, I, I wish that sounds great, but I just don't have the time, that they couldn't sacrifice a day or, or a, a weekend or a long weekend to be in a room and, and learn and, and, and have a conversation with people about a certain topic, that that's a position I never want to be in, a position where I'm not willing to make time to kind of um, take a break from life and like and, and sacrifice, make that sacrifice for uh, for the sake of, of learning. I, I never want to be in that position where um, there's not, where, where I think there's not things I can still learn. Um, mm -hmm. Making making the intellectual life and, and our intellectual growth a, a, a priority, no matter where we no matter what station we're at in life mm -hmm. and Silas, wonderful I mean, sorry super oh. quickly that as a journalist mm -hmm. um when i talk to powerful people it's about accountability you know my questions are not purely about oh tell me about yourself and your life <laughs> there's a platform here and there's a purpose to my conversation and it is not 
it, it's not curiosity. There are bounds in their expectations. So it depends, you know, it, it is the context and Mitch McConnell's not gonna get a, you know, <laughs> or Nancy Pelosi or anyone in that high level of politics is not gonna get that kind of conversation that we can have privately with each other as human beings very often. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna call in one last Thank person you. and <laughs> um, but before that, I also am going to see that was a very challenging question, Silas. So you can tell because all three of us are insisting on saying something. Um, the last, so, but mine will be super brief, which is what's the alternative, right? If you assume the alternative to me is it's assuming that you know, and it's assuming that there's, uh, you understand what the other person is doing so well that you don't need to ask. Um, there's a lot more to debate there. Uh, we can do it on the debate team, which Silas and I are both part of. You should all join it. Um, but for now, we're going to go to our last question. And uh, let's go to Stephen Lumstein. <laughs> I saw you doing jazz hands earlier, and that, you know, I have a source, uh, a soft spot for that. So please go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I heard a lot of really good stuff from everybody on how we can engage in good dialogue with those that we love, even if we are on different sides of the political spectrum. I have people in my family who are almost not on speaking terms um, mm -hmm. because of how they are in politics. And I know it's very sad for me and it's very sad for them as well. Um, what, how can I help people in my family um, who are hmm. facing that difficulty? That's beautiful. Do you mind if I take that, April? Please. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to mention during our conversation is, is um, I wanted to tie this conversation of curiosity and wonder and, and intellectual humility to uh, a broader existential crisis, I think, that is facing our country. It's a crisis of meaning. These touchstones where we kind of placed our meaning in the past, whether it was um, community or church or, or, or friendship, we, we are, th those aren't things that can be necessarily relied on anymore. And I think that the, those things that um, used to have uh, occupy our psyche and our lives, I think politics has unjustly, unfairly taken over these, th this, this space. And, and I think an important part of that is, is, is pushing it back, you know, reclaiming it and, and reprioritizing. So how can you help? I mean, do whatever you can to remind your family that relationships matter more than the, you know, daily scandal of, of whatever it's going to be. Like our, our, our news media culture is, um, they benefit a lot from keeping us angry, from keeping us paranoid, from keeping us anxious. And the best thing that we can do, we can't, you know, change <laughs> the system of our media culture, but we can change how we consume it. We can change wh where we consume it and when, where we get it from. And we can change um, how we interact with one another. And we can fundamentally remember that we are more like than unlike as human beings, as citizens, and that relationship matters more than anything else. And these are the kind of things that we talk about at Civic Renaissance. So shameless plug please everyone that's on this call sign up please and and to monica's as well i think that uh the call manager luke just uh puts that in there so thank you thank you again yeah actually that's what i was just gonna say is um lexi so uh i <laughs> i am quite certain that having heard these two lovely ladies speak a little bit you want to hear more and fortunately like i said both of them have newsletters and have just written books so lexi um I believe the link is going in the in the chat. Is there anything else you wanted to say about your book or newsletter? You're for, uh, still muted, Lexi. Oh, um, anything else I want to say about my newsletter or book? Your so book or book, newsletter? My book actually isn't quite done. I'm in the process of writing it. So if you have thoughts on civil discourse and challenges to that in our country today, write me a note, sign up for the newsletter and then help me out because I'm still in the process of writing it. I'd like my book to be a tool of healing and kind of to reframe the, the rules of engagement, the terms of engagement for how we dialogue with one another as citizens um, in this joint project of democracy that is very important. So that's, um, that's my book coming out in 2022. And um, the newsletter is Civic Renaissance dedicated to the wisdom of the past, beauty, goodness, and truth. So thank you. All right. So if you need your daily dose of wonder, it's one place to get it. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> and Monica, tell us about your upcoming book and any other ways that we can track your work. Yep. So to sign up for my newsletter, bit bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash reclaim curiosity. The newsletter is an exploration, just like the book. Again, you can't write about curiosity and think you have the answers obviously. 
Uh, so this is an <laughs> ongoing type of discussion and conversation. One thing that I'm extremely passionate and fascinated ab about and by is helping people in, uh, in very different circumstances find ways to be curious against the odds, be curious against the grain, be curious um, across the divides uh, in a world that would really rather you stay extremely predictable, right? that you stay in your silos, you stay in your lane, where platforms can make money off your attention, et cetera. Um, I mean, man, it, it's, it's uh, the messages out there are that we are so powerless in this and that we should look to our political leaders <laughs> to get us out of this. But we are so much more powerful than that. And we can do this ourselves. You know, We wake up one morning and decide, you know what? I can ask questions. I can ask questions, I can do this. There are a lot of really difficult issues. And uh, one gentleman earlier tonight brought up, um, you know, one of the toughest, which is, well, yeah, this is politics, but what if politics is harming you? What if, what if this is about who you are as a person? And that's where I would say, then even more we benefit from a world where people feel liberated to be curious. Because for people to get past hate, they have to see people as people. And there's still too much dehumanization going on out there. Um, so that's, that's the source, I think, again, of the deepest mystery that curiosity gets its best fuel from is the mystery of people. The fluency we most need today is not a fluency with ideas, but a fluency with perspectives, with the psychology of how perspectives work, interact, uh, strengthen each other, challenge each other, how we rub and polish our brains. So that's what the newsletter is about. That's what the book is going to be about. Um, I never thought of it that way. A Guide to Building Bridges in Dangerously Divided Times out in 22, 2022. So sign up for the newsletter and you will know all about it. <laughs> and I, by the way, the newsletter is also a conversation. So there's a lot of back and forth. Um, and I want to hear about people's sp specific challenges. If we could go on the Q&A, man, like, you know, we could share lessons together. And that's really exciting to me. So. Yeah, wonderful. Well, yes, on the, the theme of brains being, you know, rubbing together and being polished, my brain feels uh, shiny and clean and just wonderful after this conversation. And so what I'd love to <laughs> say is, um, <laughs> yes, I saw some jazz hands. I, I got a laugh out of you, excellent. Um, I have some serious people on the screen tonight. Anyway, uh, so Braver Angels, if you liked tonight's conversation, um, if you're not already a member, join us. Um, this is some of the most important, I'm of course biased, but I really think that this is some of the most important work we could be doing. Um, Monica and I are in it because of our families. Um, sounds like, I, frankly, who doesn't have a family member these days where like there's a serious challenge around politics and we wanna be part of the solution. Curiosity is part of it. And um, so is, you know, just, being in relationship with each other as we keep saying and so we want you to join our family um so if you go to braverangels.org which is in the um in the chat as previously stated uh you can join us for i think the it's like 12 dollars a year or a dollar a month however you want to think about it and you can hear all about what we do and um explore our workshops and our debates and all the rest of it so uh yeah join our family and um stay curious, get your daily dose of wonder. And yeah, um, thank you all so much for the thoughtful and uh, excellent conversation tonight. Thank you, especially to uh, Lexi and Monica and also to Luke and Dennis. Um, yeah, one more round of jazz hands for all of these folks.